with your, your students and your community. Uh, this again is Wayne County Community College District and I'm sure everybody has a passing familiarity with the institution. But what you may not appreciate is that this is your institution. It's created here. We've been established over 50 years and we're here to serve you. Uh, we provide a uh, service for 32 different cities and townships across Southeast Michigan. We service over 70,000 students per year. Uh, we're very affordable. We're strategically located uh, with our six campus locations off the major freeways uh, so that we're close to where either you live or you work. Uh, and we're here for you. And we definitely believe our slogan is uh, we're learning leads to a better life. And as you know, uh, education is very important. So we see ourselves as a, a, a conduit, a pathway to help you get from where you are to where you want to be. And we understand everybody's journey is different. So we very much individualize uh, what we offer here to you. But what I would like to share with you today, and I'll leave, try to leave some time for questions and answers at the end and not just ramble on incessantly, uh, is some major uh, or some general information about Wayne County as a stepping off point to what may be important to you and how we can begin to talk about your next steps if you want to come and join our community. So I'll share the screen here. Let's see if that works. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right. So this is the homepage of uh, Wayne County Community College District. And this is one of the best resources to get information, almost anything and everything you ever wanted to know and a lot that you didn't want to know about Wayne County is located here uh, with just a couple of clicks away. I want to draw your attention to the top, the kind of mustard colored banner at the very top of the homepage. That's our response to coronavirus. And within that area, there's hyperlinks that will take you to every memorandum, every announcement that has been sent out to our faculty, our staff, and most importantly, our student body, showing how we've made changes and adapt to keep their safety uh, paramount first and foremost in what we do. That has meant that we've had to transition most of our coursework to an online format for the semester. So we do have a few courses that are offered at our physical campuses, those primarily that have hands-on uh, requirements such as uh, a science lab or a welding course or something like that. But the 95, 98% of the classes for this semester are being offered in a virtual format. And again, that's a safety precaution. Point your attention to the last sentence here on the page, if you can see it, it talks about our participation in the CARES Act funding. Those are funds that have been designated from the federal government to colleges and universities to help students during this time of COVID-19. It's a pretty simple, straightforward application. Uh, matter of fact, I'll go ahead and click the link here on that last sentence. It'll take you to a letter that gives you a little bit more explanation about what the CARES Act funding is. Um, and so it's there uh, for students to review. And then you'll notice down at the bottom, there is a hyperlink and you just click that hyperlink and it takes you directly to the application. Straightforward, there's only five pieces of information it asks for. Your name and phone number, your student ID number, because it is for current students, so you have to be enrolled in the institution and we issue out a student ID number to you. Uh, you default and select for this fall semester that you, are, you must be registered for uh, classes, uh, enrolled to be eligible, one of the requirements. And I'm trying to, Get the phone to act right i apologize and then it just is a drop down and it students get an opportunity to select uh one of the categories as you see there uh housing living expenses technology uh child care internet access or course materials so those are the things that have been identified as most greatly are impacted by COVID 19 and how we can assist students with that and the um assistance comes in the form of uh, a cash payment. And so um, let me not say cash as money because it is submitted electronically to the student's account where uh, we have a third party vendor called Bank Mobile and the student set up the account however you want to. You have a choice of three ways to receive any funds that the school would give to a student through Bank Mobile. 
uh, you can uh, you can inform Bank Mobile to um, create a paper check and send it in the U.S. Postal Service to you. You can tell Bank Mobile to put it on a, uh, a card that can be reloaded. So every time the college sends money your way, it can be uploaded to the card. And you keep the card as, I think, a MasterCard logo on it. The third would be you can have a direct deposit it into an existing uh, bank account. So the student decides on how they want to do that. And then whether it's the CARES Act funding, whether it's refund from financial aid or scholarships or anything else, uh, it will be forwarded to the student that way. So I just want to show you that uh, as something that we are doing uh, to try to help support our students in reaching out. Mr. Mason, can I interrupt for a minute? Please. Okay, so the CARES Act funding is something on top of Pell Grant? Absolutely. So this is above and beyond. This is uh, kind of a one time so far um, provision that the federal government has made uh, through the United States Department of Education. So regardless of how much financial aid a student, well, not, I won't say regardless of, but if the students are eligible to receive federal student aid, and as it explains here in the uh, second paragraph, I have to be uh, eligible for what they call Title IV funds. Uh, then they're uh, potentially eligible to receive uh, CARES Act funding, even beyond what they may have already been awarded with their Pell Grant. Yes. And this does not have to go towards actual tuition and fees. It can go towards whatever expenses you are incurring because you're a student in school during the pandemic. Absolutely. And as you see of the choices, none of those are tuition and fees. It's, it's, it's prohibited for colleges to gain from this. We can't pay ourselves the money from it. Seriously. It goes directly to the student and for one of those express needs. So yeah, tuition fees and you know. Do you know how much the awards are for? I do not have that exact amount. I do believe it is tiered, uh, meaning that each one of these categories has a separate dollar amount uh, value associated with it, but I don't know the exact dollar amounts for each one. Wow. Now this, so this is something that a lot of schools are doing. We were able to do in the spring semester, which was our first semester impacted from COVID. Uh, the, our spring is from January to May, and that was smack dab in the middle of it. We were able to do this for the summer semester. And now we're able to do it for the fall semester. It remains to be seen if the department is going to continue this. So as of right now, this is the final semester students will be eligible for it. And one other caveat, it is also on the first come first serve basis. Uh, there's a certain uh, uh, budgeted amount uh, that colleges were awarded. And so uh, we award until it zeroes out. Okay. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, let's go back here. So uh, on the home page here, one of the um, items that was mentioned want to cover is in terms of what programs we have here at WC3D. If we scroll down, you'll see right below the main banner uh, a series of icons going left to right. And the one on the far left is a graduation hat called a mortarboard. Uh, it's on top of a stack of books and it says associate degrees and certificates. If you click on that, it's going to provide an alphabetical list of all the programs we have here. Um, there's over 100 programs WC3D offers. Uh, things to make note of uh, are the abbreviations. Uh, this first one for accounting, you'll see it says AAS slash CERT. The AAS stands for an Associate of Applied Science. The CERT is an abbreviation for certificate. If you look here on the curriculum, you'll see on the left, that shows the sequence of courses for the college certificate. So anytime on that list you see CERT, understand you can earn a college certificate in that area. Over on the right, you'll see that AAS, the Associate of Applied Science. Um, let's show you another example. Here's one, Business Administration. We have both an Associate of Arts and an Associate of Applied Science. So there are four categories of degrees, college degrees that we, um, that we award. 
Well, let me let me take that back. So there's six total credentials. Credentials meaning something official that you earn that can be documented and supported. The academic credentials we order. One is called a short-term college, a uh, short-term certificate. Short-term certificate. That's usually um, under 30 credits. We have a college certificate. That's going to be on a full college certificate. That's going to be around 30 credit ish. Then we have four degrees, two certificates, four degrees. We have Associate of Arts, Associate of Science, Associate of Applied Science, and Associate of General Studies. And those really have to do with the kind of uh, academic field or industry the particular areas in. When we talk about Associate of Applied Science, the key word is applied. So that is kind of a connotation. And this is a credential that you can use to go directly into the workforce. And a lot of what you consider are um, career and technical or VOTEC type of programs are sort of applied sciences. And again, they're designed to go directly into the workforce. Your associate of science class is the optimal word is science. So these lean very heavily in the natural sciences like biology, chemistry, geology, physics, and so forth. And are designed for students who are wanting to potentially continue in a STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, STEM related field at the baccalaureate degree level. Uh, the Associate of Arts uh, is kind of uh, focused more on those non-STEM, I guess if you want to look at it that way, those things that are not science, technology, engineering, and math, um, through the College of Letters, a lot of universities say it. And then we have Associate of General Studies. Associate of General Studies is sort of our equivalent of a liberal arts degree on the uh, associate level. So let me just pull that up here, Associate of General Studies. So what this does is kind of gives you the, all the general education, liberal arts courses uh, that you can use as a prerequisite and a jumping off point for anything else, in particular if you're going to a baccalaureate degree level. So I um, just want to share that with you. I do want to uh, mention two things though. Uh, one is through the Associate of Arts There's a difference in terms of the number of uh, credits required in a couple of categories between this and the AGS, Associate General Studies. This Associate of Arts is more closely aligned with something called the Michigan Transfer Agreement. And I'll, and I'll show you that in a moment, but I just want to give you an idea here. As you look at this, you'll see there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can take. Uh, there's a lot of different categories that are applicable to complete course requirements. Uh, so it, you can really do a lot to customize this. But with the components of completing two English classes, as you see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, three humanities, uh, two natural sciences, three social sciences, align up with the Michigan Transfer Agreement. I'm gonna pull that up now. The only thing in addition that you will need will be a math course at a certain level of rigor. Uh, there's a wonderful website that everybody who's thinking about going into higher education in the state of Michigan should know and be familiar with. It's called MACRO. Uh, MACRO stands for the Michigan Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. That's a mouthful. Basically what that means is that all the schools in the state of Michigan agreed to participate in this uh, organization and we share information. Um, what I wanna show here, search by institution here. You need no login, no password, no anything uh, to get in here. And they've changed up the um, uh, the navigation a little bit. And I was trying to show you the listing of all the participating institutions. And they're everyone, every single public university, private college, big four year, small two year, are all part of in the state of Michigan. And they all came together and they did two really important things. One, I'll just mention briefly, 
this uh, model guest application. So if a student is attending any school in the state of Michigan and you want to go to another school, so let's say you're at Wayne County Community College District and for some reason there's a class at Henry Ford that is offered this semester that we don't have. And you say, well, I'm a Wayne County student, but I want to go to Henry Ford you can fill out this form, or let's say you are already at Wayne State University and you want to come to Wayne County. You can have this form filled out. And by virtue of you having this form filled out appropriately with the endorsements, no matter what the class is, if that first school, your home school said you can take it, then the other school is obligated to allow you to, regardless of prerequisites, regardless of testing, as long as there's seat availability. So just want to let uh, students know that. So that works everywhere inside the state of Michigan. Uh, but the other important thing that they did uh, was they created this Michigan Transfer Agreement. So this MTA agreement, you find all the information. If you look right here, it uh, lines up with our Associate of Arts degree, all except for that it does require uh, this last one here, the um, math that's at a college level or higher. That is not part of the Associate degree. It is part of the MTA. Uh, so for students who are looking to uh, take a, a, a grouping, a cluster, a core of courses uh, at Wayne County that they then can have confidence and assurance that will transfer to any other school in the state of Michigan altogether, uh, they can do that with that Michigan Transfer Agreement. And that will satisfy all the liberal arts requirements at all the schools, meaning that if you do that at Wayne County, for example, if you were to do it, you could complete with a two year associate of arts degree, plus the MTA transfer to whatever school you're accepted to at the junior level with just two years left to go with those courses focusing on your major. If that's something that you're interested in, I want to just show you one other thing that is an aside to this uh, macro organization and it is called mytransfer.org, M-I for Michigan, then the word transfer.org. So this also came out of the uh, Michigan Community College Association. I want to try to make it easier for students to be able to confirm if their course is gonna transfer from one school to another. Again, you don't need any special login or, or passwords to get in. Uh, there's a lot of great resources here. Again, you see the Michigan Transfer Agreement is here. Uh, transfer your associate degree. Uh, but right here, transfer your courses, the second one. It's really easy. You go from the institution or to the institution. Uh, it's only a couple of drop down boxes. So let's say you want to go to uh, uh, Wayne County Community College District. The one limitation is you have to go by subject. So let's just say you were interested in psychology, for lack of a better word, PSY, psychology. You, so you can select an institution or you can just leave it open. As you see, as I scroll down, it'll change colors. So for every college in the state of Michigan, it's gonna show you who accepts the psychology courses from us, what they call them, what we call them on the left, what they call them on the right, uh, with their nomenclature and how many credits it's worth. And you can click any one of these for details. So this is a way so that you know as a student that what you take will be transferred. And you can always double check by uh, going with that um, transferring institution as well, just to make sure you see. So everybody's listed here. Um, I was just gonna go down to, uh, let's say I have Michigan State since we're here. And we just go details, uh, the psychology 101. So here you go. So it gives you right here, if you were to take 101 at Wayne County Community College District for three credits, it transfers to Michigan State University as their Psych 101 for four credits. Um, the one caveat about transferring courses, at, and both transferring courses and courses for graduation requirements must be uh, completed with a letter grade of C or better. Your final letter grade has to be a C or higher, uh, both for graduation and for transfer as also financial aid. Uh, so financial aid requires maintaining a 2.0 uh, GPA, making sure you complete every course with a C or better, or you could jeopardize your funding. That even may apply to scholarships. 
uh, for graduation requirements. It has to be Sierra Better and to transfer in order for another school to say that you learned it, you got it, you can demonstrate the competency and proficiency. That means at least a C. If it's less than a C, then you really didn't learn it. You really didn't get it. So they're not going to give you full credit for it. The GPA does not go over only the credits, but they won't consider that unless it's a C or better. So my rule of thumb is for students, if you find that you perform less than a C, always retake the course so that it can count towards graduation and um, transfer and keep your financial aid. One other thing to um, about if you do have to take a class again, and I hope nobody does, but if you do, the system allows for that, your, the, the, your second attempt or the attempt with the higher letter grade uh, supersedes the original. So let's say it were me and I took a physics course and the first time I did it, I made a D. The second time I took it, I made a B as in boy. Uh, both courses will still be in my transcript, but what we do, we exclude the first one, which was the D as in dog, in, in terms of calculating GPA, and we include the second one, which was B as in boy, for inclusion. Uh, so a, you can see both classes, you send your transcripts to Michigan State University, they can see both classes, but they'll know not to count the first one because it'll be excluded and only to count the second one because you can only give credit for the class one time. So we'll do it for the one you have the higher grade for. But to prevent you from having to retake courses, I want to share with you that we have a great resource here for all of our students once you're enrolled and you have your um, student ID number, you'll be able to log into the student portal we call WebGate. And WebGate has a lot of resources to it. And one of the main ones is right on the main menu. You see it says main menu, welcome back. And that was the last time I was here. The very last one at the bottom is Bank Mobile. I mentioned that before, you set up an account. So if monies are ever owed or due to you, uh, it'll be processed through that, however you choose. The one right above that is Smart Thinking. Smart Thinking is our on-demand, 24-7 online academic support solution. And um, I apologize. This is just telling you you're leaving your WebGate portal, you're going to Smart Thinking and uh, you'll need to make sure that your pop-up blockers are disabled. We recommend you use Google Chrome when accessing uh, the college's website and the student portal and all the other things we have at uh, Wayne County. Google Chrome really works well. You'll have less issues. And this is, it just pops up. Uh, so this is, uh, let you know you can get a, a smart app. But what I wanted to show you past the dashboard, if you scroll down a little, right here, it's gonna give you some tutorial videos and they'll show you exactly how the program works, uh, how you get into it. I'll show you just um, so that you can see a um, listing and you can access it different ways from here. Uh, also across the top, you click the same thing. Uh, the different subject areas. So you'll see math, science, Spanish, nursing, writing, business, computer, uh, career and technical. So there's a lot of different areas. You can schedule a session, so you can have an appointment, a half hour block, uh, and someone will be there, or you can just drop in and ask a question. Uh, there are different study aids that are here as well. I just wanna show that really quickly. Um, on the left, you'll see these video lessons on math are already here loaded up. General resources, uh, give me some information in terms of writing specifically. We have digital content in a variety of subjects here. Some of the digital content will comprise of animations. Some will be uh, charts. Uh, here's graphics and figures as you see here. Uh, uh, others will be uh, animation and uh, charts and uh, there may be uh, logs and stuff. So there's a lot of information here and it's all by subject. So there's over a thousand here just in physics alone. I haven't even gone halfway down the scroll. Um, Things are here as a very uh, easy, accessible, user-friendly uh, method of using the whiteboard where you put your information there, they respond back. You're able to save uh, your experience, your tutoring session. So if you're covering something this week and the midterms come up, you wanna go back and review it, it's always there. 
Uh, the Writing Center is a wonderful resource that it does require a little bit of pre-planning on your part. Um, if you know an assignment is coming up in two weeks, uh, for example, you have an opportunity today, tomorrow, to do a draft, upload it, give them 24 hours to respond, get that critical feedback. They're not going to edit it for you, but they're going to make notes. They're going to circle. They're going to highlight. They're going to give you things you need to look at. You can pay attention to that. You can absorb it. You can respond to it, uh, correct your draft uh, uh, in another day or two, upload it, give them 24 hours to respond, get it back. If you do that at least two times, you should feel very confident about the paper that you're turning in to your instructor and feel good about getting a good grade because you've had professionals review it at least twice your initial draft. You made the tweaks, do it again. They come back with thumbs up. You're feeling good about it or, you know, I'll just polish it up a little bit and do it there. But again, it does take a uh, up to 24 hours for them to respond. So it takes a little pre-planning and not to wait until the day before the papers due to try to get help. Uh, and this so is it, access through the student's web, web account? Yes, through your web gate, your student portal with your student ID and your uh, PIN number, you're able to access this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, even over the holidays and everything. So that's, that's awesome. A, so that's, that's a great one there. Um, let me go back. One back too far. Uh, another thing that uh, students can do that's important for you to know is that you'll have an officially assigned student email account. Uh, the easiest way to understand what it is and how to work it is when you log in through this main menu, about halfway down, you'll see it'll say view your student WCCCD email address, view your provided email address. You click on it there, and there's, there's mine as a student. This works the exact same as a Gmail account. So for any of you that are familiar with Gmail, you go to the exact same access point. You go to Gmail, it'll ask you what's your email address, you'll type it in exactly as it is. They all end with at mail.wccd.edu. You put that in uh, and then it'll ask you for your password. Your password will be the exact same thing as your PIN number for WebGate. So by default, your PIN number for WebGate will be your six-digit birthday. Two for the month, two for the day, last two of the year. You can change it at any point in time. So whatever you change it to, that PIN number acts also as a dual role. It acts also as your password for your email. And the great thing about the email, because it works just like Gmail, if you put it on your phone, program it in once and save it, you don't have to worry about opening it again. It'll just be there and you can set up notifications and just use your thumb and hit onto it. And any announcements you have with financial aid, scholarships, or if we have something else we have to adjust uh, in response to COVID-19 to keep people safe, we'll do that. Speaking of which, I do want to share, because we're going virtual uh, and most of our programming is offered online this semester, uh, how students can understand what that looks like. Uh, from the home page of our website again. If you scroll down that same area, you'll see this time there's uh, kind of a finger hitting the keyboard with the globe in the back. It says distance learning. We click on distance learning. It's going to give you these three short paragraphs here to introduce you to our Center for Distance Learning. And there's an entire uh, staff dedicated to supporting this. But you'll notice this very brightly blue colored button right here. New distance learning students enter here. So all you have to do is read those three things, hit that button. It's going to take you to this letter. This letter is going to give you important information in terms of the technical uh, part of it, what you need to have. Uh, also, the help number and the help desk email, help desk phone number and help desk email so that you know and it's um, it will respond to you pretty quickly. It also gives you a reminder of how you log in. But just to make sure everybody understands, because this can be a little intimidating, up here in the upper right-hand corner in yellow highlight with big bold font, it says click here. We click there and it's going to take you to the student blackboard orientation. And it explains to you on this slide, it takes approximately 45 minutes to an hour to complete. It's going to be multiple slides giving you information step by step by step how to use our platform called Blackboard. Blackboard Collaborate is what we use. And um, it also has video content in there. 
at the end of the orientation, there's a quiz and it explains you have to score 80% or better on this quiz in order to activate your account. Because we want to make sure that you are in a position to be successful and that you know and understand how to utilize it. You can take the quiz as many times as you need to, but every answer to every question is in the presentation and every question is something you need to know how to do in order to be successful in navigating the platform and participating in the courses. And you simply navigate it with the word next that's under the title. It'll take you to each one of the screens as you go through. And you'll even see like right here on the fourth one, this video. You just hit the button, you continue to go all the way to the quiz. So that's uh, how to get the information uh, to take online courses here at Wayne County Community College District. You only have to do it the one time. If you take three classes, you don't have to repeat this three times, just one. They all work the same. If you do it this semester, you don't have to do it the next semester. It all works the same. Um, but the thing I want to bring up to you is that student ID number that I said was really important that you will uh, be assigned. Um, that ID number and that PIN number you use for WebGate will be the same two credentials, the same two identifiers used to access your Blackboard account. So you use the same things for Blackboard as you do WebGate and uh, use the same PIN slash password for your email. And to access WebGate, you can do it really quickly uh, from that same area. Just right over here on the right hand side, you see the Blackboard logo. It looks kind of like a little chartboard of BB. You click on to it and on the right hand side, again, it gives you some uh, notes and on the right hand side, log in. There you go, my username and password, the same as in WebGate. I can also log into Blackboard from the home screen. If I wanna just come down to the Vision of Student Services, uh, excuse me, uh, distance learning from here, or just type in blackboard.wccd.edu. So that's the online classes. Let me pause one second to see if there are any questions and I do wanna go back to uh, some of the questions here. We had uh, fall registration application, um, where to apply, okay, tuition costs, counsel fee. Oh, let me uh, first pause. Are there any questions so far? You can use the chat function or um, or you can speak. Anyone, I know we have a few participants here. I'm good so far. Okay, okay. At any point though, if anyone does have a question, please use the chat or you can uh, vocalize. So let me share again. Like I didn't really have any questions, but uh, some multitasking, but um, is the enrollment still open? Wonderful question. For this, for this term right here. And when, when is the deadline for this semester? Excellent question. Excellent question. Let me share my screen and let's pull this up. So right here, um, homepage of the website. Uh, if you notice here, fall classes started August 24th. Uh, oh, didn't mean to click that, sorry. Uh, and we do have, I'm coming up to our calendar, academic calendar. Subterms. So here, uh, classes begin. Hopefully, you can see my highlight here. Uh, our main term, our 15-week semester, began on August 24th. Uh, so that goes from August 24th to December the 12th. We have another subterm that just began on Tuesday, September the 8th. And that will also go to December the 12th. Um, then we have uh, our third subterm, part of term three, uh, that starts October 15th. And that again, will go to December the 12th. So to answer your question, students can still enroll. They still can register for classes for this current fall 2020 semester. We do have availability in the part of term three that begins on Thursday, October 15th, which would also be the last day or deadline to enroll in classes for that term. I do want to draw your attention to this college calendar that we publish every semester as well as the important dates uh, when we begin academic advising, when we begin registration, when classes begin, 
the last day students can drop at 100% refund or drop at 50% refund. Uh, when we have welcome week, when balances are due, application deadline. If there are holidays or school closings, they'll be listed here as well. Uh, the last day students will drop class period, uh, final exams and so forth. So all those important critical dates students need to know, uh, we do publish uh, each and every semester. Well, this is another question in regards to the enrollment. So is it just like certain classes that they can enroll in at certain times, or is it with the sub terms, you know, they have the first class, the first enrollment, and then if they enroll in the second enrollment, like, are they still held accountable for all that work, or is it just a shorter semester for that class? Wonderful question, excellent question. So it, it, they are different semesters in and of themselves. So they have different beginning dates and ending dates. So uh, the subterm one, uh, excuse me, main term one is 15 weeks. The subterm starting on October 15th is just gonna be seven and a half weeks. So let's say um, you have student A and student B and student A did a, um, a speech class and, and, and uh, part of term one for 15 weeks. That speech class is going to be for 45 contact hours through between August 24th and December 12th. They're going to have a syllabus and they're going to do all the assignments. Student B takes a speech class in part of term three uh, that starts on October 15th. They're also going to have a speech class meet for 45 contact hours, but between October 15th and December 12th. And they're going to have a syllabus and they're going to have assignments and they're going to do everything there. So the same amount of time you will spend in class are equal. The type of assignments, tests, quizzes, whatever, they're equal. Uh, what happens is that just how the time is configured is a little different. One starts earlier, the other one starts later. So for the one that started earlier, because I have a longer period of time, I'm going to show you by looking at the schedule. So here at the bottom, this orange button is schedule. I'm going to go to the academic schedule. Uh, matter of fact, let me go to the flex start one, because that talks about the subterms. I mean, you can come in at different points. You'll notice here uh, at the, here it has a, a start date of September the 8th, 8th September 2020 for that grouping. Let me scroll down here and see if there's any for the October. So basically you're saying the, the first start date, they'll probably meet for like an hour. And then the second date, they might meet for like three hours. And the next one might meet for like four hours or something so, like that. That's the theory. That's the kind of idea. Yeah. Is that But you're not going to have students select classes from each of the three tiers? Tip, typically, no. Typically, no. Uh, there are some programs that we kind of call fast track, like in our automotive service program or a criminal justice program, where it allow, let's say, uh, I have to take breaks one and breaks two versus waiting two different semesters. I can kind of squeeze all those in in the one semester, take break one the first seven and a half weeks, take break twos at the second seven and a half weeks, and I finish both breaks within that fall semester, or this kind of same with criminal justice. So for those fast tracks, that's typically the way to go. Uh, but I have seen students take, uh, let's say in that example, breaks one, breaks two, but I also have um, a sociology course that's for the full 15 week semester as well. So I have three classes. I have one that stretches all the way out, 15 weeks and then I have two one the first seven and a half weeks and the second the second that can happen as well it just really depends on what works well for the student and what helps fit the students needs and we just kind of go from there basically what academic advising does and that was another bullet point you had on your list is that uh, we want to make sure and get an understanding of the students goals and objectives then we're going to lay out what the opportunities are here these are the programs that may be useful to you. These are the classes that will help you. Here's the curriculum guide you need to follow. Now, in order to complete where you're at, take X, Y, and Z. Now, from there, once you know X, Y, and Z is what you need to take, the student is free to select 
however X, Y, and Z is offered. If it's offered the first term, the second term, if it's offered fast track, uh, modified, uh, if it's offered online or physical, if it's offered in the day or the evening or the uh, middle of the day or the weekend, uh, all those things, which if it's Instructor Jones or Instructor Smith or Instructor Williams, those, those are all up to the student's discretion of how she, he or she would like based upon uh, their scheduling needs. We say, nope, you got to take X, Y, and Z, but what days, times, locations, and modality you take X, Y, and Z is entirely up to the student. What is the maximum number of credits you can take per semester? Awesome question. Awesome question. Um, a visual I can show you here off the home page. Though it's not directly geared towards that, I think it's helpful to see it. Uh, the green button at the bottom is financial aid, which is a wonderful resource and it really helps walk you through the entire financial aid process. Uh, see how to, uh, all kinds of things are here on this page. But to answer your question, I want to go over to the left this navigation and go to book voucher. And I want to show you sort of the tiers uh, of enrollment as according to financial aid. So if you think of it as having a stair step, a staircase with four steps, at the top of the steps, we'll say that's full-time enrollment. That's at least 12 credit hours. Typically, the max is usually 12 to 18. Once students enroll in 15 credits, uh, they have to have um, a sign off or permission of an advisor to go from 15 to 18. Um, so uh, 12 credits or more is considered full time. Then if you take one step down, it's a 25% reduction because full time is called 100%. One step down, 25% reduction, that gives it to 75% or three quarter time, three quarter, 75%, between nine and 11. Most of our courses here are three credits a piece. We do have some two credits, we do have some four credits. Uh, but most of them are three, so that typically means you're taking three classes if you get between that nine to 11 bracket. Uh, another step down, another 25% reduction, so now we're at 50% or half time, and that's between six to eight, so that's about two classes. Uh, and then you have the final, the bottom step uh, will be less than half time, they kind of prorate it and so forth. The reason why uh, that maximum number uh, as full time is 12 or more, and we typically you have to get special permission to go beyond 15. Is the rule of thumb for it to be successful in higher ed is for every hour you spend in class per week, you should spend twice that amount, double that amount outside of class doing school related work. So the easiest part about going to school is actually going to school. If I have to log in on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, between 10 to 11, that's the easy part. The hard part as an adult with other responsibilities is finding that study time, that reading time to do my drafts, to do my research, to all that kind of stuff. So that's the homework kind of thing. I need to spend twice that amount. So again, just really quickly and we'll move on. So if I'm spending 12 hours a week in class, double that is 24 hours a week outside of class. Together, that's 36 hours a week combined inside class, outside homework, 36 hours a week combined. And if you were to work a full-time job, that would be 40 hours a week. So the equivalent of time and effort and focus and attention that you would have on a full-time job is what you would do if you were a full-time student, because that's about 36 or more hours per week that you'd be dedicating to your education. And that's why once you get above 15 credits, you get special permission uh, to try to go all the way up to 18. Students can do it, but it is taxing. Um, and so you see here those stair steps and, and, and the, the dollar amounts are adjusted if a student receives a, a Pell Grant, and this is specifically designed for book voucher, uh, that's how their maximum book vouchers will be adjusted. Now, not everybody gets maximum, but to use that same type of formula. So if my book voucher was only $1,000 and I was enrolled full time, I get 100% of that, 1,000. If I was enrolled three quarter time, I'd only get 75% of that, 750. If I was enrolled half time, I'd only get 50% of it, 500. 
And if I was enrolled less, then they kind of calculate it from there. But the primary idea is, and this is something I want to make sure students kind of understand, think about, absorb, comprehend, let it marinate. While it is true, technically, the more classes you take, the more financial aid you get. That is true, but that's kind of the reverse argument. The idea is the more classes you take, the higher your tuition and fees. So the more financial aid assistance you need. The fewer classes you take, the less your tuition and fees, the less financial aid assistance you need. So it's not the idea, well, I need to take more classes to get more financial aid. <laughs> it's that you need to take the classes you need to take and allow financial aid to help you pay for the classes you need to take. Because sometimes students become overwhelmed because they have this false perception, this connotation that I need to take four classes, I need to be full time, or I won't get financial aid. No, you'll get financial aid. You won't get as much, but you don't need as much because you don't have as many classes and you, you don't have as much tuition and fees or cost of textbooks. So that's just something to consider as you're going through that process. We're able to access this page. Oh, like, yes, um, absolutely. This site Let me to show the again. left with the scholarships and grants, we can mm -hmm. access that page. Yes, so here we go. So homepage, bottom, the screen button says financial aid. It takes me here and on the left hand side is kind of a gold navigation color and has a lot of things here. What we were just at was just the information where it said book voucher. That's where we're at. But however, let me bring your attention to a couple of great things here. This second one, financial aid TV, it's like a curated YouTube uh, of just financial aid related videos. And you can search by what your videos are and you can look at the different categories and it'll break down everything. So you say, why do they need this? What is this? What's the problem? What's the next step? It'll be right here in a nice uh, three to five minute video to give you that information. We communicate your financial aid uh, status uh, via your student email, which is why I showed you where it is and it's important that you check it, as well as your WebGate portal. And inside the WebGate portal, there's an area for announcements. And so you find an announcement and you really don't understand, you can always go here and get that better explanation of why you need to take those next steps. I uh, want to show you uh, when you talked about um, scholarships and grants, uh, there's one here. Oh, where is it? Uh, disbursement loan cost. Sorry, scholarships and grant down here. These are some of the scholarship opportunities available, and that's directly through financial aid. Let me show you the other place uh, that there are scholarships. Uh, before I move to another place, just to be mindful, there's a lot of great uh, information here in terms of loan, in terms of net price calculator, your student rights responsibility. Um, how disbursements work for financial aid, uh, the enrollment verification process, which is important that uh, students attend classes virtually or physically uh, because we can't disperse the financial aid until we have a process called positive attendance or the instructors would say, yep, the person that signed up for the class is here. Uh, and this one right here is satisfactory academic progress. This is something, this is a federal rule through the Department of Education. When you're filling out your FAFSA, it explains it to you, and we explain it to you as well. It's a condition, and students have to uh, be within these guidelines. Uh, it's a lot of reading, but it basically boils down to three big rules. You must successfully complete 67% of the number of credits you attempt each semester, which basically means you can't register for a lot of classes and then drop them. You got to register for them, complete to final, final grade at least 67% are the ones that you attempt. Uh, you must maintain at least a 2.0 grade point average each and every semester, and you must be on track, on pace, to complete your program within 150% of the number of credits required. So that's very important, and sometimes students make boo-boos and get in trouble for that. There's a process to appeal it and to get a second chance, but it's important that you understand that the Department of Education requires schools to monitor this and to adhere it. And this can, this is a, one of the biggest determining factors if you're eligible for aid or if you have to terminate your aid. So I wanted to let you know that. Now, back to the other scholarships. If you go to the homepage under students, current students, 
and the left-hand navigation over here. By the way, this is a student services landing page, which will segue into the next talk about academic advising. But over here on the left, uh, there's a link that says apply for scholarship. It'll take you to this page here with listing of all of our internal scholarships. Uh, every school has their own scholarships. We have a fund that is dedicated only to use to give out to students. Now there's an application process and you have to fill it out and be with the deadlines and blah, blah, blah. Not every student gets them. So I tell students that yes, wherever you go, look at internally at that school for what monies they have available. Always a great thing, but don't put all your eggs in that one basket. There are other resources as well. There's a website called Scholarship America. That's a great resource. There's a website called Fast Web. Our financial aid department always refers students to go to F-A-S-T, you run fast, web, like a spider web, fastweb.com. Uh, the free sources, you should not ever have to pay to apply to get free money for a scholarship. Some scams are on the internet that say, well, just send me 35 bucks, send me 150 bucks, and I'll give you all these scholarships. You don't need that. Something else is going on, smells fishy. The only thing you should have to pay for a scholarship is the cost the postage to put the stamp on and send in the mail. If there's anything else out of that, or maybe getting your copies of your transcripts, if that costs you from another school, but you shouldn't have to. Um, but like I say, fastweb.com, scholarshipamerica.org. There's an app that's called uh, My Scully. Scully. Scholarly, Scholarly. Now the app costs, I think it's $3 for the app, but that's $3.99 a, a month. Yeah. So, but there's a lot of resources there. And I also tell people, hey, what you do in your regular life, look, if, if you go to McDonald's and get stuff, look at McDonald's corporate website. They have scholarships. If you drink Coca Cola, if you wear Nikes, if you pump gas at Exxon or Mobile, all these places have scholarships. You have to do a little lead work and digging and look, go to the homepage of the website and type in scholarship or just go to Google and say scholarship for African-American, scholarship for African-American female, scholarship for a left-handed African-American female or urban, whatever the case is, and you'll find a lot of resources and take some time and effort, but it's worth it uh, because uh, uh, churches, civic organizations, all those places have scholarship organizations as well. And if there's something specific you know you would like to study or do, like you want to go and be a, a, an architect or you want to be a, a welder or you want to be whatever, those professions have organizations. And each of those organizations has either a Detroit chapter, a Michigan chapter, or a Midwest chapter. And they have scholarships as well to try to encourage more people to go in. So we definitely want to... Uh, look at the school definitely apply is there to help students and we can't do anything with the money but give it away that's all we can do is give it away so do that but don't let that be your uh first only and last stop uh, looking for scholarships um we were here on the landing page uh for student services i uh, want to make you aware of a lot of great resources here and um how we're processing how we're advising now we do have our campuses open even though instruction is online, each one of our campus locations is open. Uh, you can use the libraries, you can use the computer labs, and yes, you can speak with academic advisors. Uh, we also are doing online advising. There's an email address we've set up. It's called student services, a student singular, services plural, all lowercase, all together, no punctuation, student services at mail, M-A-I-L dot W-C-C-C-D dot E-D-U. And uh, you can send your questions there and you get a response back. The more information you give us, like full name and phone number is really helpful. Sometimes students say, hey, this is John. What about X, Y, Z? I'm like, what can I do about that? So <laughs> uh, if you give us your, your name and your number, and then once you're uh, a student and you have your student ID number, that's extremely helpful because that links everything in the computer system where we can find and research and so forth. We also have a phone number. We have a student uh, success hotline. I believe it's located right here on the uh, home page uh, where it gives a, uh... here we go. Our student success hotline right there. You can call us as well. Uh, after hours, you do have to leave a voicemail message, but it'll be returned the next day. Uh, so that's how we're doing phone. I'll put up that email address uh, so that you can see it. Uh, 
So if you look right over here on the right, hopefully you can see under the blue S, that is the email, student services. Can everyone see that? Yes. On the right under the blue, student services at mail.wccd.edu. Uh, you can send them there. Uh, we get them in all day, every day. And we, uh, we do respond to each and every one. Sometimes we may have to respond a couple of times to get specific to what you're doing. And then that phone number I showed you, let me go back to it there on the home page so everybody can have the number. Uh, one more, here we go. The Student Success Hotline, 313-496. Uh, maybe if I hover over, it'll stay. 313-496-2634. So that's the number and our campus locations, which you'll see across the top here. They're all open. Uh, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Thursday, each one of those locations. Uh, Fridays, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we're experimenting with Saturday hours to based upon uh, the demand we get. So I want to share that information with you. We have a lot of online tools that you'll have access to and your WebGate account to show you your progression towards degree completion. I was um, looking at this right here. Let me try to hide the name so you don't see that. But this is what's called degree works. You'll be able to access this uh, in your WebGate account. And it will keep track of, as you see the blue bar requirements, the percentage you've completed towards your program, be it certificate or a degree, and the percentage of credits you've completed. The little red boxes show things that are outstanding that you still have to complete uh, in order to uh, meet all the requirements. The green check marks say, hey, you're good to go. And a blue wavy line would indicate that you are currently registered for it. Uh, and that what this basically does, it reads your transcript uh, and it reconciles it against the course requirements of your particular program. So this is something that's extremely, it only really is effective after your first semester once there's something to read, but it helps keep you on pace because any one of these, I'm like, well, why do they want me to take this BL201? I can just hover over it and says, oh, that's business law for four credits. If I click onto it, this page opens up and it will show me the um, class description out of the catalog as well as when it's being offered that semester. So I can look at it. So this is extremely helpful. Now it's a tool to use with an academic advisor. It doesn't replace an academic advisor. So, and students can register online. Um, so let me just see if there's anything else. Uh, please, again, if you have any questions, what else we need to cover? We talked about the types of certificates and degrees. Uh, the, oh, I'll tell you the determined point of interest. Let's see, learning resources. I'll show you another place on the website. I talked about academic advising, talked about financial aid, tuition costs, I'm gonna show you that. Uh, where to apply, admission requirements, okay. Let me show you where to apply admission requirements and tuition costs, and then we'll talk about the other learning resources really quickly with the time remaining. Um, where to apply, home page, this green button right here will take you directly to it. Also at the bottom, this blue button, both are entering WebGate. Uh, from this page here, uh, if you have not applied at Wayne County before your first time, the second option, apply for admission. Uh, what you'll want to do is uh, click the link under the button that says login, first time user account creation, click that link and then follow the prompts. You'll check, I'm not a robot, you'll create a temporary user ID and pin, hit login, and it'll take you through steps of asking your, your name and everything. It's important that you fill in each field of information so that it can complete the application automatically and generate a welcome letter to you automatically that will have your student ID number. Sometimes students say, hey, I didn't get anything and I got to wait and I got to call. And that's because they skipped a step. So it's important that you don't skip any steps uh, when you do the application. Um, it is pretty uh, intuitive and self-explanatory. Uh, you'll want to at the bottom of each page, just go to continue, continue to next, continue to next, and it'll naturally navigate you through admission requirements. Um, there are no admission requirements. Anybody and everyone is welcome. Uh, if you're under the age of 18 and you have not completed a high school diploma or GED, 
you do need to get permission from a parent or guardian. But if you have completed a high school diploma or GED and or you're over the age 18, you're welcome. Uh, so that's all that it takes. Uh, you'll go through the admission process. They'll generate the ID number, as I said, immediately at the end. So you'll have that welcome letter and the ID number. From there, you'll be able to log into that WebGate account from the same area. Now, you asked about uh, tuition and fees. We always publish our schedule right off the home page. And part of the schedule, it's usually about the seventh or eighth page. Uh, here's this college calendar again that we looked at before with important dates. And shortly after that will be, um, shortly after that will be the tuition and fees here. So you'll see the tuition and fees on the left. It breaks everything down. There's the tuition per uh, for students in the district. Uh, you'll see the fees, the student uh, activity fee, four dollar per credit. Technology fee, seven dollar fifty cent per credit. Facility fee, two dollar per credit. Science lab fee, only if you're registered in a science class. If you're not taking biology, chemistry, physics, geology, you won't get it. But if you do take one of those, you will. Um, same for the health science and the disciplinary fee, only if you're taking those courses. And then you'll see the other fees that are listed there. Well, that's a lot to kind of keep track of. So we have the chart immediately to the right of it. So let's say I were a full-time student. Let's say I'm in district. And it does explain it up here on this page. Let me scroll to where it talks about what is in district and out of district. Let me show you that. Residency up here on the upper right hand side. Residency, hopefully you can see my highlight. Um, these are the places, though they are geographically located inside the boundary of Wayne County, they are not part of our service district. So you'll see Dearborn, Garden City, Highland Park, Livonia, Northville, Plymouth, parts of Canton would be considered out of district. If you live in Wayne County in any of the other 32 different municipalities, except for those, then you are in district. And so you get the in district. Notice on the left-hand side, the seniors, uh, for seniors who are 60 or older who live in district, we waive tuition and fees. That's something that people may not realize. So if you have uh, uh, elders in your family, friends, relative church members, they want to go to college, they want to go to school, keep their mind sharp, uh, exercise their passions, they can do so when we waive the tuition and fee. In district, 60 or older, okay? Uh, come back down here. So in this example, let's say it were me, and I want to go full-time, 12 credits. I'm in district. I just come down to this chart, and I'll see in district with fees that will cost me $1,521.20. Now that's just tuition and fees in district does not include the cost of books and materials and supplies. So now let me show you the next page here. This is our deferred tuition, a minimum of 65% or, or having financial aid is required when you register. Even if your financial aid isn't finished, at least if our system can recognize you're in the process of financial aid, it's okay. But uh, outside of that, if you don't have financial aid, aren't planning to use financial aid or not eligible for financial aid, 65% is required at the time of registration. And this shows you how that difference is. So in district with fees, 65% of that 1500 was uh, $988.78. So those are the costs and the costs are always published each semester. It usually doesn't change very much from semester to semester, but they're always out there, as any other schools ought to be. So, um, and the last thing is here on this email that we talked about the registration deadline. We said your last time for this semester is October 15th uh, application. I've showed you where you can apply for that uh, and uh, tuition costs, where you can locate that. Financial aid, we've talked about that. It's important you do that fast, but it has to start with the FAFSA um, and include our school, our school code on that. I'll show you where you can find our school code. Again, I'm going homepage for financial aid, right across the top here, how to apply. There's information here, bullet point two, submit the FAFSA and it has our school code right here in bold, 009230. Make sure that's part of it. Um, go through these again. Uh, I've talked about 
online counseling, phone counseling at the campus will help you with that. Uh, learning resources available is going to be the last thing uh, uh, and with the steps of interest. Uh, we talked about the degrees and certificates. So we have a couple of instruments that help students uh, identify what they may be interested in. Uh, they're basically surveys and these surveys say based upon your answers, students who answer similarly to you go into these fields. So it gives you an idea of what to think about. Uh, so we definitely can, uh, and at no cost, uh, we have two. One is called the MOIST, the Michigan Occupational Interest, Interest Survey, and the other one is called Highland Self-Directed Study. And the Highland Self-Directed is very comprehensive. Once you finish that, you'll have like a 15-page um, readout that'll be emailed to you uh, for your own reference that'll break down uh, your strengths and weaknesses, some of the things of your personalities, uh, but especially giving you detailed information about career pathways and fields, as well as educational pathways that you uh, may be well suited for. It's not a magic crystal ball. It doesn't tell you everything about yourself. It's giving you idea and reference of something to consider. So that can be used in consultation with an academic advisor. For folks who are kind of, I'm not really sure I could do this or I could do a lot of things and I don't know, it's always good to start sort of with that idea of uh, the social and general studies. And as you're taking classes, you'll naturally get an idea of what you like and what you don't like. So, yeah, I took that psych 101 and yeah, that's for the bees. I'm done with it. I don't want to take anything more with that. Well, that's great. We learned a lot by process of elimination. Now we can just cut out a whole series of programs and courses that require upper level psychology courses if you don't want to do that or math or whatever it is it happened to be or you may say hey i took this anthropology class and i love it i want to do more well let's look at the other programs and careers that lean more on that way so that's uh, another method we can do as well um and the uh learning resources uh we do have uh our libraries at each one of our campuses um excuse me uh, you can wait so, hold on one second. I just want to open the door. I'm still here, Ms. Currington, with my call from the uh, organization that we're wrapping up. So, Mr. Martin's aware. Um, these are folks um, that are from the Virtual Academy, the ATA, uh, uh, Educational Services. So. Mr. Martin, help put this together. Thanks. All right. So I uh, want to make sure in our LRC, our Learning Resource Center, that you can, um, you know what? Let me do it from where well, I should tell you to go, right here. Um, right here. So most of our services are located here. There's a tab for career plan and placement. We have an awesome tool that's called Candid Careers. Again, it gives you videos and searches of different programs. We have everything from distance learning to our emergency alert, to our uh, student activity calendar, to our global conversation speaker series. All the stuff is right here at a, at a click for you. Uh, our TRIO Student Support Services uh, Federal Grant Program is all right here. But let me show you uh, what we talked about Learning Resource Center. So these are our libraries at each one of our campus locations, again, that are open even during the pandemic here. Uh, and there's a lot of resources here that you can use. You can uh, uh, look at digital materials from across the state. You can request hard copy books. Uh, if they're not available in our library, they have an interlibrary loaning program so they can get it from another library to us to you and you just turn it back into us and we'll turn it back into them. Uh, they, off, they also hold workshops and um, seminars to help students with uh, how to be more successful, uh, how to do research, uh, what are the different services and so forth. So you'll see here they talk about that they have with, um, I apologize my phone, I can't get the volume to act right here. Um, well, you certainly know how to make it go up. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. I, not a way to disconnect it. Um, but the dial net, uh, 
uh, Area Library Network, the Michigan Electronic Library, MELCAT, uh, the South uh, East Michigan L League of Library InfoPass. So all those things you can get. And with your student ID card, that, that operates as your identification. It operates as your library card. It also operates as a magnetic strip on the back that's used for any printing at any of the campuses or any photocopying. And um, that's utilized by, you. it does cost, I think it's 15 cents per print and it's like 10 cents per copy or something like that. And you can load it up. Uh, I used to students to start with a dollar and load it as you need it. And there's uh, machines at each one of the campus locations, usually by the bookstores where you can do that. Uh, so that when you do need to print out things, uh, you can print them out, or if you need to make photocopies, you can do that. Often, also, there are um, reference materials at the LRCs. Most, of, many of our textbooks are there. You can't check them out and leave, but you can check them out while you're there in the uh, in the building and uh, utilize that. Uh, sometimes there may be a gap between when students start classes and they're able to get their books either through a book voucher by financial aid or other means and so uh one other thing about that I'll show you is really great and really easy uh right here from this page you'll see across the top bookstore once you register for classes and you have your student schedule in your web gate all you have to do is go right here select your campus let's say i was at the uh, downtown campus for fall what courses oh i registered for a um no, no, it's peace class. Well, come down here to speech. Uh, the course was a speech 101. And in my, on my web gate account, it tells me exactly which course I am. So I'll know what section I'm in. So let's say I was in section 308. And I just go find materials for this course. And it's going to tell me there's something, this is what uh, they're recommending. There's five different options. Uh, you know, so wow, five options. Yes, uh, this one at the bottom option five, it's a bundle. You notice it has the same title as the rest of them, but also has with connect access. Many of the textbook publishers have these kind of uh, access codes to give you access to their own websites to support the instruction and material that are uh, uh, combined with the textbooks. So let me just show you really quickly, because this is important for you to know for another reason. So let's say I'm looking at this first option, option one. That's the textbooks. I rent a digital copy for 180 days for 56 bucks. Rent, you gotta give it back and it's digital. Well, you don't give it back, it just disappears. Option two, I rent the digital copy for 360 days for 72 bucks. Now there are some classes you just may need one semester, so 180 days is fine. But let's say I were taking a biology and I was taking anatomy and physiology. Well, there's a part one and a part two. So it may serve me well to get it. I'll be using the same book for both classes, one year in the fall and then another one in the January semester. So that might work out for me. Uh, that's option two. Option three here, this is the digital book. I'm renting it uh, with the code, the, the connect online access code and the book renting it for 180 days. So that's a one bundle. This is I'm buying the digital book only. I'm buying it outright. Don't have to turn it back. It's mine to keep forever. And this is the bundle that I'm buying the book and the code versus renting. So, uh, most of the books, uh, are, well, I won't say most, a great number of the books are digital now. But the important thing about it is this um, ISBN number. So if I want to see the items and I see this ISBN number, this lets me know once you have this, you can go on the internet and look this up anywhere, whether it's Amazon or um, uh, eBay or Craigslist or anywhere. And you probably can find it much cheaper. And it's okay to shop around. The only place students can use their financial aid in terms of a book voucher so that Uncle Sam will buy it for them, unfortunately, is through the bookstore. There's a monopoly there. But that's not the only place you can get it. And I've seen a lot of success of students going to websites like Chegg and other things 
the book that was a hundred and something bucks that we had, they were able to get it for less than 25 bucks. So you can definitely take that ISBN number. Uh, that's kind of the little barcode number if you ever look on the books and that identifies that exact book, that exact edition, da, da, da. If you get that, wherever you find it, you can get it. And so if you find it cheaper, buy it cheaper. If you find it cheaper to rent, rent it cheaper. If you want to get the physical copy, you can do that as well. So I just want to let you know that it, it, what, no school should hold you hostage and that there's only one place that you can get your textbooks and you, there's only one price for that book, be it a physical book or a digital online version, that you can look at the ISBN number and shop around. And if you find it a better deal, go for it, either physical or digital. So just want to bring that to your attention as well. Are there any other questions? I know going through a lot of information, I don't want to miss anything that uh, is a burning issue or is very important for you. No, you pretty much covered everything, Mr. Mason. Um, now that I know that you've got a closed date of October 15th, um, we could do this again. Ooh. And probably around October, around the same time. Exactly. Be when we start registering for the following semester starting in exactly. January. Exactly. So if students aren't ready right now. Maybe this whole thing with the COVID and you got kids and uh, got to be online learning. M maybe it's not the best time for you right now. You got to get that sorted out. And I, I respect that. Uh, but to let you know, there's always another opportunity here at Wayne. Now, what I would tell you, if you have not done it yet, please do begin the FAFSA process. It is a process. Just because you fill it out is not, well, out of mind, out of sight. You have to go back in and check on it. You got to make sure that they got it correctly and that there were no errors, if there need to be adjustments and so forth. So make sure that you do, uh, if you have not completed the FAFSA, that you do uh, do that uh, so that you're ready for either October 15th, which is still time, or when we go in January. So we can get all those ducks in a row so that you can get uh, the, the funding up front and get that book voucher uh, so that you can get your, uh, your, your materials and supplies to be successful day one of the semester, the day one of class. Good deal, good deal. So I would like to thank you for your time. And uh, again, we'll do it again just before October 15th and again before the January registration. And again, uh, Ms. Curriton, uh, please feel free to share my contact information. I know you have my emails and it has Absolutely. my number. Uh, share that with uh, anyone who's interested. And they don't have to wait until October 15th. They can call me or if they feel comfortable going through you and you reach out to me, I'm fine with that too. Uh, we want to encourage you. We want to let you know we're here to support you. So 15th is great. And what I would ask the folks who attended here today, uh, let your other people know we'll be doing this again on the 15th. Let your cousins Absolutely. and them, tell your cousins <laughs> and them, uh, put on your Facebook and your social media Absolutely. All again on the 15th so they can get this information too. Thank you so much, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Thank you very much. I look forward Have to hearing from everybody. Have a great day. You too. Bye now. Uh, excuse me? Yes. Uh, can I get uh, Mr. Mason, right, your contact information? Sure. Here, I'll put it right up here on the screen. Thank you. Actually, you don't have to do that. If you will just email me, I'll send everything to you. Okay. Yeah, okay? No Good deal. Thank you. Bye now. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe.